Hi. Uh, so I've been totally looking forward to this, but I have to admit also, I was just at another conference. I just literally, this is my second 9 a.m. keynote in a row. And um, I haven't really figured this out. I was a professional programmer in the 1980s, and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Um, and I, but I didn't have a great social life, and so I decided to go do a master's degree, and I'd always been interested in artificial intelligence, and I wound up here. And I haven't programmed professionally since 1998. Uh, and so I've never been to this kind of conference. So, uh, but I also have been completely disorganized. I don't know what I'm doing today. So I'm planning to spend all day at the conference. If anyone has its suggestions about what I should go do, maybe this, the sprints mentoring, I don't know what I'm gonna do, but anyone come up to me, that's great. But I'm going to go, I'm gonna try to go pretty fast through the talk and hopefully we have a big conference, uh, conversation at the end. Because I do mostly now talk to academics, to policymakers, some of whom, many of whom are clueless, a few of whom are smarter than people make out. Uh, and things like that. I love being back with the people who are actually building the software and getting f you know, feedback and finding out if I'm behind on anything. So I really hope that we have 15 minutes of conversation and you guys tell me what you think. But uh, this isn't all that's going on. I, I don't even know how, that's supposedly four different ways of getting in touch with me, but let's face it, we're mostly still on Twitter even though we don't want to be or something, I don't know. Um, let's talk about this. Is AI product or a person? Oh, let's, let's ask you guys. How many people think it's a product? Anyone think it might be a person sometimes? See, this is why I like being in these kind of groups. Okay, sorry, sorry, like, there's, yeah, there's like one person, okay. But, but um, a lot of people think I hate robots because of some of my papers. And I love robots. Why do you think you go and do a PhD in AI? Like, I love, these are pictures I took, right? That, that I was uh, a meeting, these, these guys were building this robot, right? But of course it's a product. It's something that's built, it's, re it's replaceable, replicable. This was academics, but the vast majority of AI is of course coming out of, it's extensions of corporations, right? You've got a piece, like a, a bit, like a, a, mag a microphone and a camera and some intelligence of a corporation in your house if you have one of those speaker thingies, right? Or of course if you have a mobile phone, right? So yeah, this is a product and this is a person. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to talk, actually, it's a lot of words in this. It's not that many pictures in this talk. Um, well, oh, yeah, I forgot. I have some theory part at the beginning. OK. So what even is regulation? A lot of people hate regulation. They're like, oh, why are you regulating us? And it's like, what are you talking about? So I come from biology, right? And, and like gene regulation, right? It, it's like how we persist. Actually, I think there's a slide about this, right? But there's up regulation. There's down regulation. This is one of our papers uh, about looking at um, the fact that even things that look like they might be bad, mutations, right, negative things, that, that they're recoverable and they're part of the process of innovation, right? You know, this is, this is biology, right? So regulation is just the means by, any, by which any complex entity perpetuates something into the future that's basically it, right? You all know this thing about that your cells are dying and in seven, in seven years you don't have any of the same cells. It's not exactly you. And you look older. And, and countries look different, and, and, and companies look different. But there's something recognizably like you in the future, and that's what we're all working on. And governance is when we do that explicitly. So I just showed you, like, nobody is sitting here trying to plan their gene regulation, right? <laughs> but we are planning, like, what we're when we're going to eat next, and that's a part of regulation. You're trying to regulate your weight. Breathing is regulation. These are all regulation. So... <clears throat> So when do you call something explicit? And again, I love doing consciousness, but I only have a half hour here. But you bring me back if you want my consciousness talk. It's really fun. Um, but anything that's uh, spoken or written about, right? So I actually, therefore, if, you, if by this definition, I don't have any trouble saying that AI is conscious. I just don't think it's a moral uh, patient if we back it up, <laughs> right? So corporations and other societies, including families, everything, we all self-govern. Of course we self-govern. Corporations must self-govern or they wouldn't be here tomorrow. <clears throat> but we also coordinate. So we have geographic interests. I mean, talking about this in the Czech Republic right now is extremely evident. But we always have problems like, and even before the, the COVID, I would use this example. Like, if your kids are vaccinated, it doesn't help that much if the neighbor's kids aren't vaccinated too, right? And there's this whole thing about um, the air quality and water, you know, can you even get clean water? These are all things that you coordinate, right? And you get your nation to take care of these kinds of things. It's like, we, I, a lot of people have this idea that government is some like alien agency, but we constitute the, the, the nations that we compose. And the nations that are composed by geographic proximity 
Government is the way that we coordinate. So we should constitute our governments too. We should realize we have an obligation to uh, reflect the interests of our communities through our government, right? That's part of what we're, the model I'm trying to communicate here. So I, I just said that, <laughs> right? So that's what we're trying to do. All right, so governments both provide upregulation. Like I don't think there's a government anywhere in this continent that isn't pouring money into the digital economy, right? It's, it's just, it, they, put, they give us lots of support, but they also restrict us. But restrictions, again, if you learn AI, you learn this too. Even restrictions can help you because it's like, you know, literally, it's not that you're just searching under the lamppost when you're looking for your keys. It's that someone's sh shown a spotlight where the keys mostly fall, <laughs> right? That's what, that's what good governance is like. Now, we all know there can be bad governance too. But this is why we want to work with our governments to make sure that the spotlight is in the right place, right? So that's the kind of model I'm trying to describe here. So now let's talk about what the EU is specifically trying to do about AI. And, um, oh, you know, that's okay. We've got plenty of time. I don't think I included some slides. Let me think. Yeah, I didn't. I'm going to just tell you this. A lot of people think AI is only happening in China and in uh, the US. And that's because these people made this sort of misinformation figure where they looked at the biggest companies, right? But a well-regulated economy doesn't allow really large companies that, that, that the governments can't control well, right? So if you just, we, we did a paper called Is There an AI Cold War? And we showed that the EU is actually comparable to China if you look at how many companies have at least two patents at the national, international level um, uh, in, in AI. It was one category of AI, model-based AI. And, um, and also, if you looked at the market capitalization of those companies, right? And actually, the rest of the world, if you exclude China and the US and the EU, the rest of the world combined has, is about the same level as China and the EU combined. But the US is dominating on those two metrics. But that's partly about the metrics too, right? But anyway, the point is, there's tons of AI in Europe. And a lot of it is, as you guys will know, is embedded in like conventional industries as well. It's not just that we have like big superstars, but there's, you know, it's, it's everywhere. Okay, so um, yeah, so this is all the, the, people talk about the AI Act a lot, but look at this, the EU is really busy. And again, I don't know if you guys know what we have here. It's like this incredibly lightweight bureaucracy. It's like one of the cheapest, for the amount of stuff it does, it's one of the cheapest bureaucracies in the world. It, it, you know, because it is that extra layer, so we have to pay for our governments too, and then we're paying this extra thing. But it's pretty smooth. So anyway, all of these things <laughs> are that people, and I'm not gonna talk about, I just sort of talked about, but in this talk I'm not gonna talk that much about the Digital Markets Act, which is about basically this market dominance by small numbers of actors, mostly foreign. Um, but the Digital Services Act I'm going to talk about, and the GDPR and the AI Act I'll talk a little bit about. Um, and I could talk about liability if you guys want me to. And the other stuff I'm not even that involved in, uh, the more financial end. All right. So um, the GDPR, like if you think about what is it that when I came, so I don't know if you guys know, I'm an American, and then I moved to Britain because it was cool. I, and, but then when I was in the EU, uh, in the UK, in the EU, I figured out that the EU was really cool too. And so I took a British passport specifically to have an EU passport, right? <laughs> it was in 2007, but anyway. So, so when I was start, and, I, and again, we're regulating AI in the EU. We're not regulating it very well in the UK or the US, although they're kind of starting, right? Um, but when I thought about what do we need to do, I mean, I was trying to figure out about Google since I did a PhD at MIT and a lot of my friends were in Google and I was interacting with them and, you know, and I was just like, what is this new entity? You know, I didn't learn about this in high school civics. What did, what did, and also I think that about like the Red Cross and these, you know, various NGOs like this, Europython, right? What is this new community? But anyway, Google had a lot of power and it became evident that the government was looking at that and I'll show a slide about that later. Um, but anyway, a lot of the things I was worried about are in the General Data Protection Regulation, which we've had as a law now for like five years, right? So making sure that there's valid consent, we all know that's, in fact, I hope you know that, that that's been gamed. You know, it's supposed to be in the law that it's just as easy 
to, uh, to reject is to, is to accept, and that should be on the first screen. But also, the, 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 the parliament, they anticipated that not that much software would pop up those windows. So a lot of people are popping up those windows, like why do they even need to keep uh, personal data, right? The idea was that like, don't do that, right? But a lot of the, the big corporations were deliberately trying to make the EU look bad by making it really annoying having these really crappy windows, right? But anyway, um, the, the transparency requirements, the, the fact that you can correct data that, that's wrong about you, which actually we have interesting discussion about that, some of that I, that's one of the things I'm not crazy about. Um, I would, I would like, I like correction, but I don't like the, uh, the deletion um, because you need to know why you think something, right? It's your externalized mind. So I'd rather have the, the corrections uh, labeled there. But anyway, data portability and uh, of course the automated processing. That's like one of the fundamental things. If somebody decided something about you using a machine, you need to be able to see why and you need to be able to contest it, right? Okay. So the Digital Services Act is really super interesting too. I don't know if anyone, who here has like worried about the Digital Services Act? Like no one, oh my gosh, <laughs> you guys. So the whole point here is that yeah, we want a safe, predictable, trusted online environment. And so we have to defend our users rights. So it's basically about three things, which again are the main uh, threats of AI. If you think about how societies are being manipulated, which are these stupid recommender systems. <laughs> right? Sorry, how many people work on recommender systems? Okay, sorry, <laughs> but I, I personally, I think that like, you know, Twitter and Facebook both started going south when, when, when they took away your capacity to just see the people that you were curating, the people you followed, right? And now it's like, it's pretty random. Anyway, so it's not random, that would be better. Uh, anyway, targeted advertising, obviously that was a big deal, particularly in political advertisements, that, because we have all these protections in order to try to keep our government good. Um, but they're based on people being able, able to check if the, if the political advertisements are honest. Well, but if everybody's seeing their own created on the fly political advertisement, how can we possibly police that, right? So targeted advertising is a problem anyway. It's also a problem for like gambling addicts and things like that. But it's a super a problem for democracy, right? And then of course profiling, like how did you decide to serve me this advertisement? What was the information you had about me? Why can't I transparently find this out? There's this thing with Facebook. Some, some, uh, so they started, they said, okay, you wanna know here. You click on this thing, why did I see this ad? And it shows you three reasons you saw the ad. And some researchers at, at Princeton started taking out some ads and they figured out that um, what Facebook showed you was the three least informative things. <laughs> right? So the, the thing that actually really narrowed you down, you would never see that. But it's like, you know, the, the, you almost always see like your gender or something, right? Because like, like half the people, you know, are, are getting focused on that or not, depending on your gender, of course. But, you know, it's, it's not, um, but that, they literally were, were deliberately choosing that and revealing it. So that's, the EU is trying to stop that. They're saying, no, we need something clearer. So, um, yeah, that, I talked about this already. So, um, yeah. There, there's something weird going on with targeted advertising, and I don't understand it, I'm not an expert on this, but some people claim no one's making more money. It isn't actually helpful. Everybody thinks they want to know about their, their customers. I find this really problematic. If it's true that all these people, like everybody switched, look at this, everybody switched, right? Everybody switched to using Google and Facebook. This is, this is what, I mean, people say like, oh, AI robots are gonna take our jobs. This is like the main, one of the main industries that we destroy jobs in, not by making better news, but by just taking the entire revenue model away from journalism, right? So anyway, so everybody switched, they all want this thing, and yet they're saying like, oh, when we turn it off, we don't seem to lose any money, <laughs> right? It, it, it's not clear that it does a better job of selling stuff. Um, so yeah. I find it hard to believe that this kind of massive shift is just, uh, is just trend or fashion. So maybe the, the numbers and economics haven't been worked out correctly. Maybe somehow it really helps with your innovation to have this information about your customer base or something. It's also possible that there's some kind of external thing. And speaking about those slides, uh, you may see this says no foreign. It's a little hard to read because I guess that somebody has decided you can put this on Wikipedia even though it says no foreign. Um, but anyway, uh, this is one of the, the um, the Snowden slides. Um, and, and so we didn't know 
that these people had all signed up to this uh, until Snowden. And, and Google didn't know that they had been hacked by their own government. You know, they weren't happy about signing up to this. They, they, were, they were the third held out, I guess. <laughs> but, they, they, uh, but, they, but they were really unhappy when they found out from Snowden that they had been hacked, right? So something weird is happening. Let's get down to the AI regulation, though. I think it's almost like a decoy. It's so boring. <laughs> it's, OK, so yes, famously, we're categorizing AI into stuff that we ban in the EU, because that's not who we are, right? That's the theory. Right, so that includes um, social credit ratings, which incidentally, China has also signed up to the UNESCO thing that says we should no longer do social credit ratings. So, um, but also it's about biometric scanning. So it's okay that if your passport has a, you know, knows who you are and you go and you can check your passport, you've consented to having a passport or whatever, but it's not okay that people are tracking you as you walk everywhere in the street and they know exactly where you are. Which incidentally, again, I've heard is true of cars, at least in Britain. There's so many car cameras in Britain that they know exactly where all the cars are, and, and um, which a lot of people are associated with cars. Anyway, so uh, so yes, yeah, so there's things. Those are the things that are banned, and then the vast majority of AI. Although again, that's what they said about GDPR with the with the uh, things. But the vast majority of AI is supposed to be no problem at all. Um, and then there's this little category which is high risk, and that basically means if you have a product that can change people's lives. Okay, <laughs> I'm enough of a geek and enough of a psychologist that I know every product changes people's lives. But what they mean is things like education, uh, uh, welfare opportunities, uh, whether you get a loan or not, uh, medical stuff, those are the things that are in this uh, high risk category. But then what happens to if you're in high risk, I already talked about that, um, is uh, you, you just have to basically do DevOps. It's really weird. I mean, this is like something that every other product you already have to do, right? That just for some reason software has been excluded from normal product law. People were arguing that software is a service, it's not a product. Although some people argue that services are also products. I don't even need to go there. In my opinion, uh, software is definitely a product. Uh, it can provide a service, and I think people get a little confused. Again, that's the AI thing. If it's providing a service, but you sold it to someone to provide that service, or you built it as a part of your corporation to provide that service, it's still, a, well, it's actually when you sell it to people that it becomes a product, right? So anyway, people don't like the idea that software is a product, partly because it's so um, agile, right? That, that, the, that the libraries change out of under you, and they're saying, how could you have a product where, you know, the, the, you know, what if you were building a bridge and you had concrete that collapsed? And you said, well, this isn't a product because the concrete collapses all the time, right? No, you can't use that kind of concrete, right? We're in a situation, we're building a lot of software now as essential infrastructure, right? That's why people are trying to figure out how to hack it, right? It, you can't run a city anymore without software. So you can't build it, the, the concrete, you know, the libraries have to be something that, that, that even if somebody does something really weird and something goes away, the city doesn't fall over, right? Does that make sense? Okay, I hope so. So yeah, a lot of, pe a lot of people, the EU said compliance is gonna cost nothing because you guys already keep these records, right? And, and, uh, and then some like American think tank that hates the EU said oh, it's gonna cost every company, especially the little ones, two million a year. And so a colleague of mine, she's actually uh, Mary Hatia, she's super cool, and she is Finnish too, so it took me a long time to pronounce her name. But she, uh, she really did most of the work, but we went through all the stuff, and she had a lot of experience in SMEs and also a little bit in, in like, you know, consultancies or whatever. And it came, it came out to somewhere between like 80 and 200,000, depending on the kind of company that you're running. So compliance costs. If you're not used to doing compliance, then you know, obviously this is a new thing that goes into your, into your uh, bottom line, right? But I, I was just at another conference kind of like this one, only it wasn't pure programmers, it was something called Euro Chatbot. And the, a lot of the people there work for things like banks. It turns out that like a lot of the people with NLP, they're trying to reach out to people to help them figure out things like servicing their debts, taking care of their health care. There was a lot of uh, NGOs that were trying to help people you know, connect into welfare services, whatever. Anyway, if you're in a normal company, like, like a bank, you already have, there, you know, or you're, you're doing a financial, there's a guy in an SME, and he, he said, I have like, you know, 40 people working for me. Every year, I personally do the compliance. It takes me two weeks. 
it usually improves my business when I go and I rethink about that. Which is, again, that's, that's good governance. If, you've, if, you've, if the stuff that you're doing compliance on is actually helping you think about how to do your business better. And, he says, and then I spend half a day on the GDPR. I do not know what <laughs> these tech companies are complaining about. It's just nothing. You know? So that, I, I've heard that um, from a number of people. So anyway, of course, you don't hear that from, from pure tech companies because, again, it's the first time they've had this particular burden, so that's really shocking to them. So anyway, it's not that expensive. Um, and uh, the, the one thing that every piece of AI has to do is that you have to make sure people know they're working with AI. Okay, now this seemed like a no-brainer to me, although I knew people were faking it. I mean, I was in America for a little while between 2015 and 2019. My partner was working for uh, Princeton, and I was like, you pick up the phone, and I, you know, as an AI expert, I was not sure if I was talking to a person or a machine, but they call a lot. And so I started hanging up on the phone on things that might have been people, right? And it was just wrong, you know? So anyway, this is a part of the, of the AI Act. And the Eurochat people freaked out. Nobody had told them. And it turned out that it's hard to say if you're talking to a person or a machine. Because what's going on is there's real humans, and they're sort of orchestrating a lot of sort of bot-like things, you know, just, ex you know, Problem solvers for a particular context. So you think you recognize, oh, this person's having this problem with their password or something. And then you shunt that bot to them. So it's like a hybrid between a person and AI all the time when you're having these online conversations. So they don't even know how to say that. That'll be, I'm, I'm sure that'll shake out in like a year. <laughs> a lot of, we're, we're all geeks, right? We want things to be binary. We're like, oh, is this going to work? Is it not going to work? A lot of things in the law, it's just like, you know, just give it a minute, we'll figure it out. Lawyers are actually really easy to talk to. They're, they're surprisingly like hackers, right? They, they make things work. They're like people who really, you know, get stuff done. Um, so anyway, but it is an interesting problem we're going to have. Um, I would have preferred, a lot of people say famously the AI Act is uh, um, proportional, proportionate, um, uh, risk-based. And that was supposed to be, speaking of binary, that was supposed to be a continuum. But unfortunately, the more conservative wings, apparently, I've heard two stories about this, insisted that there were these levels, right? That, and as I've just told you, there's actually like four levels. The, the no problem is two levels. Um, the, the, uh, but I, would, I think that for the rest of us who are not necessarily classified as high risk, it would still make sense for us to sort of partially comply. Because again, it's just DevOps. Uh, with some of the requirements, these reporting requirements, and, and just think about them. So, again, I, you guys are programmers, so I could probably go through this part much faster. Um, a lot of people, uh, oh, I have to, this is one of my famous bugs. So I, I'm the person, I was one of the people in 2017 that published that paper that showed that AI is racist and sexist um, if you use machine learning, and it's exactly as racist and sexist as the people whose data you've processed, because that's the whole point. You're, you're learning what they do, you know, and what they say, not what they think they say, but what they actually do. Okay, so what this is, I don't know, like, this is Finnish again, but it's not my friend I've just mentioned, it's somebody I don't know from the internet, but in our paper, uh, um, Eileen Kaliskan did this with Turkish. So Turkish and Finnish, both, um, the, he and she is the same word. Okay, so in, in Finnish it's hein. and. The point is that how it got translated into English depended on the rest of the sentence. All right, so this is just a standard thing you can do. You can play around with this for, with Google uh, Translate yourself, okay? So it isn't that Google Translate itself is sexist. It's that it just is more frequent to see she next to laundry than to see he next to laundry, right? It's just showing you the probabilities. That's the way the language is in English, okay? There may be some countries where men do most of the laundry and then it would be he in that language, okay? So, so anyway, people are very upset about this <laughs> and they want to fix it. And, and so what they wanted, uh, and this was, oh yeah, that's that paper I just told you about, right? And it's, uh, yeah, so, oh, geez, I can't remember my own talk, I'm sorry. Let, first I want to point out, what, it's what I did, this is what I just said. In this talk, there's this thing called wheat and it allows you to see how racist or sexist your, your algorithm is. But there's this other thing called we fat so, it, so wheat was the word embedding association test, uh, uh, test. And I forget what the F even is for this, but, <laughs> but you, take, you take your rating of how well associated a word is 
with uh, being very uh, male or female or, 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 or um, you know, various races or whatever your, your axis is. You put that on the y-axis there, and then you look at actual data. So these dots here, the left is the thing that was producing all these, these sexist comments. Um, the, 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 the bottom is the labor statistics or the census about who has names. So this, these dots are like the first names, English first names like Alex and Chris. And you're saying like how many of these people are male and how many of these people are female. And then the dots over there are um, the names of jobs. And unfortunately, some jobs had two words. So if it was like domestic engineer, uh, we just have engineer there. So that's probably there's kind of the noise. These are huge correlations. I mean, this is with the 1990 census. It was the last US census that had the information about the first names in it, right? So that was the closest we could do. And notice this is the English language web. The, I, I was just at a meeting where people were freaking out that the English is so dominated by American experience, <laughs> you know? This is, if you're using these chatbots, they're gonna start biasing your society to be more like America. Right, you're using the English ones, right? Because th this is the, it's, it's all reflecting the norms of our experience because there's a lot of American text. Anyway, so enough about that. I already sort of said that. Back to this translator problem. The point is that literally the first draft of the EU AI Act, nobody's perfect, it said unbiased data. There is no unbiased data. In fact, by the old way we used to talk about machine learning, Every regularity is a bias, and that's what you're looking for. That's knowledge, right? And it's also knowledge that it turns out that mostly women are doing laundry. Like, that's something we can mine, and it's actually a fact, right? And, and we might want to correct it. That's what consciousness is for. We can choose new targets. But currently, it was mostly women who were doing laundry, right? Anyway, people are saying, let's have unbiased data. If we just use a simple, transparent, easily auditable uh, algorithm, then we are going to get this stereotyped output that replicates our lived experience, all right? But we can choose, if we want to, what a fair output looks like. Now, this is super hard. Again, you think fairness is easy? No. It, like, say you want to have, um, again, not just to choose gender, um, if, if you want to have the equal number of men and women uh, in some kind of position, and then you have to make a decision. If, if that's what you want, and you don't have uh, the same kinds of test scores, you're using tests, then you have to change the uh, opportunity. So it's harder for either the men or the women, depending on which ones are currently dominating, to get in. So you can't have equality of opportunity and equality of outcome unless you started in an already fair system, right? But once you've chosen which fairness you want to apply, then you could either do something where you have some human readable hacks, you know, like there's lots of ways to just write rules and say, let's make this happen. Like, you know, when you're, when you're doing text prediction and you choose not to uh, express bad words, you know, that's very easy to read. Or if you're gonna do something complicated and you want to, then have a second step of the algorithm. Now, I used to think that, uh, I, so I wrote this paper and we said, we think it's really important to have this compartmentalized. And yet, almost everybody who cites that was all trying to warp, you know, to re distort, as if they could choose all the isms, the original um, learning thing. And I was really worried the reason they were doing that was because if they could get rid of the sexism, they could also make you more likely to go to the people who are their advertisers or whatever, things like that. So I thought that they were just being uh, mean, <laughs> bad, yeah, they're just trying to hide things. When, when we give a corporation power, that's what happens. Um, that they could, they could be distorted for good reasons even, but to do bad things. Um, but it also turns out, of course, it's a little slower to have to have these two steps. But I was just at a meeting um, about generative AI, in fact, where the American companies are starting to realize this is a problem. They're saying it might be worth doing two or three steps so that we can justify each of them. They're just starting to see that the compliance people are coming to them. So anyway. So the, this whole thing is a translator, and don't freak out about the fact. Another thing that bothers me is people say, we're not even gonna train our system on corpora that includes you know, uh, bad language, you know, th a derogatory language, things like that. If you don't do that, I mean, who is it that's producing this derogatory language? Quite often, it's disadvantaged minorities, and you're saying this AI system won't be able to understand them, right? 
So I don't think we, we shouldn't have moral panics about what winds up in that first box. We should worry about this bottom box, about what the company allowed out as expression, right? But what it comprehends, well, we want us to understand our world, right? So yeah, so if that's, the whole thing is a translator. It's not just that, that one little box is a translator. And the point of the DevOps is that every stage of this should be auditable and replicable. I mean, this is news. This is news. You go talk to, uh, um, well, it was news a few years ago. Now the AI Act <laughs> reflects it. Um, that, you know, because Microsoft and people were, were used to helicopter into meetings, like policy meetings, and say, you're going to lose deep learning if you start trying to regulate because we can't explain what, what each of the weights does. Nobody goes into a bank and says, tell me what all the synapses are doing in each person that works for your bank. Right? That is not the question. The question is, how did you know it was a legitimate product that you could release on the world, right? And so that's about like, you know, I'm, I'm telling these guys about like build to test, right? You know, like that we've been doing that since like 2000, right? That was like when the, what, the, the Agile Manifesto came out, right? So all you have to do, and this is news not to you, but to these people, like somebody architected the system, somebody designed it, now, we don't know, you guys know better for your own companies than I do, AI companies tend to be way worse at this than normal software companies about whether someone saved all these papers, right? But sometimes somebody architected it. And there's logs, there should be uh, revision control logs, again, telling them that there are these things is, is like this big uh, insight. Um, and uh, there, you know, there should also be the testing logs. And we also, once the system is active, if it is an AI system, you often keep track of the inputs and decisions, not too long because of the data privacy, but if there's a car crash, that's, so you keep it like for like 24 hours or something, right? Like a camera. Okay, so the point is that all of this is for the benefit of developers, as you guys know, right? That's why we started doing, I mean, I remember when revision control was a big deal, it was the 1980s. <laughs> right? And we're like, wow, this is cool. And then I started using it just for myself so I could keep track of my old versions of things, right? It's like, but, um, but it's also uh, potentially auditable. So both the Digital Service Act and the AI Act assume we should be able to audit. But you, you can talk to these uh, consultancies. They say, oh yeah, you guys say that, but you go into these companies, those files are not there. That, that record is never there. It's negligent. Okay, again, any other product, if you couldn't prove you had done the right thing, then you're held liable for any problem made by your product, anywhere near it. You need to be able to show that it was the user's fault or somebody, you know, somebody hacked into your system. You need to know if there's weird behavior, is it because of your software, somebody hacking it, or your user abusing the system? That's the kind of thing you need to be able to talk about. So anyway, like I said that, Ordinary product law presumes the capacity to prove that you've done due diligence, followed best practice, avoided the worst practice. And that includes documentation that most of us do all the time, unless you're in an AI company and you came out of a physics department and you didn't take CS 101, right? Or systems engineering, at least, which is sometimes second year. Okay, so yeah, uh, yeah, the, and the, the, so the, there's another question, which is who is going to do this? So the consultancies, they make their money off of these financial audits, so they won't touch the people that are already financial auditing. But they, they're talking about this like as some kind of risk assessment, like they do that for people that are trying to move into a new area. And like, no, you guys also do cybersecurity. Why aren't you building up from your cybersecurity? Because in the first place, if the system isn't cybersecure, then everything else, you know, who knows what these records even are, right? So these guys are not thinking about it right. And I, I do really worry about this. We've written all these laws. We've said, oh, we can make the world a better place. Are there people that can actually check the audits, right? Um, uh, there's two different ways to increase the numbers of people. One is by training them or something. But the other is uh, by making our software more transparent, more comprehensible to, to other people. So making sure the documentation is clear, stuff like that. Um, so. Yeah, I, I feel like I've talked too much about this compliance part, but I was getting excited about the geekery of it. <laughs> and most of you don't look like you're asleep yet, so that's quite impressive. Um, but the point is that, uh, I'll, I'll, okay, I will say this. The DSA tells really large companies that they have to think about what the threats are, and they have to come up with a way to address them, and then the EU is just gonna check their work, right? And again, if you have a, a computer science degree, you know, theory of computation, it's easier to check whether they did something right than to do it in the first place. Um, 
in theory, right? Um, so one thing to remember is even if right now we don't have the, the, uh, the um, enforcement and audit capacity, and there's been a big problem with the GDPR that it has not been enforced adequately, uh, because we're talking about digital records, it's still worth doing the right thing because in the future, maybe someone will do this with AI or something, right? So we could go back and do a lot of uh, older work. All right, so how much time have I got left? I don't even know who's my chair. I have 12 minutes, including questions or? No, oh, geez, okay, I wanted to be in conversation by now. Okay, how many people want to see the actual AGI slides and how many people want to start arguing already? Uh, okay, I don't know, okay, first, uh, AGI slides. Okay, <laughs> arguing already? Okay, okay, <laughs> all right, I, you lost, I'm sorry. I was just, this is a deep mind person at the last meeting I was just at. She was talking about, um, and they did a pretty good job. They really talked about all the different kind of harms that she could think of, like, you know, like including things like treating AI as human-like. Um, and then her example was something like, oh, you know, if they say, how many legs do you have? It says, well, you know, I'm a software system. I don't get to have eight legs or something, you know? Um, and, and, you know, whether malicious use, uses, and then the things we've been talking about, discrimination, hate speech, and misinformation. And then she said, well, I've looked and I've read the, li I've read the literature, and there's only benchmarks on the first two, so maybe the other four aren't things we can police. Like, benchmarks are not the only kind of policing, right? Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I just told you this stuff before. But, um, so anyway, oh yeah, I know why I was going to do it this way. <laughs> so um, I, I mentioned before about this WeFat thing, that the point is that, um, yeah, that this is stuff that we get to choose, sorry. Even like Steve Colbert figured out, okay, the problem is that you trained your system on the internet, right? They're, duh. And they all treat the internet like it's some evil thing. No, there's lots of real information there. It's not the internet, it's the whole problem. So, yeah, I mentioned this before. Uh, even if we're only worried about biases, that uh, they could come from negligent engineering practices, adversarial assaults on the system, uh, deliberate engineering. You could have one person in the company that's deliberately trying to uh, disadvantage somebody else. It could be the design. There's this thing in Idaho about that, like, you know, a, a new government comes in and they don't like putting a lot of money into welfare, and so they just say, okay, we're going to use a machine learning system that gives less money for disability, right? Um, so, yeah, as I mentioned, the audits thing. So, anyway, back to her. <laughs> so, the, you know, that she's like, what can we do when there's no benchmarks? Well, first of all, take responsibility for your product. Call it a product, right? Make it, don't say, I don't have any legs. Say, you're interacting with a digital product of DeepMind, right? There's a totally different tone to that. Um, uh, so yeah, practice transparency early. You don't have to wait for the AI act to come into place if you really want this stuff to work. So I, I got into AI ethics because I was working on this robot and um, you know, someone's posed it to look like the thinker, but it didn't work at all, okay? At this point, the, it turned out that the CPUs weren't properly earthed or grounded if you're American, right? So it was like, it was not working. It was basically a statue. And there was all these other robots around that did work, but people would walk up and say, with that particular robot, it would be unethical to unplug it. And I'm like, well, it's not plugged in. And they're like, well, if, it, if you did plug it in, I'm like, well, but it doesn't work. Yeah. People really want they, want, they were proud. They said, um, we know that, uh, I'm like, why are you so sure? It's unethical to unplug it in, uh, and unplug it. And they're like, well, because we learned that from civil rights and feminism, you know, the most unlikely things turn out to be human. <laughs> like, yeah, so you think that uh, a, a woman is as much like a man as a pile of motors is like a man, right? That's like weird, okay. So anyway, people really demand to have things that the AI is something that they can fall in love with, best friends, partners, spouses, equals, um, but they'll have complete dominion over it, right? They can turn it on and off, they can buy it. Now, people have wanted complete dominion over their partners for a long time, unfortunately. So I really think this is um, a feminist issue. Anyway, an issue of human rights. Complete dominion is not partnership, right? Um, I have a conjecture that part of why there's a rise of this transhumanism idea that these two you know, things are affecting us very differently is that we over-identify with the artifacts partly because we feel like we're losing ground. And so we really, really want to think we can expand ourselves uh, through, our, through our coding. But um, 
Kant actually talked about this, and I don't know how much, I, I want to get back to the Q&A. Uh, Kant was saying, uh, look, uh, so I don't know if you heard about this, Descartes, apparently, uh, not Descartes himself, but parties of Cartesians, they would light a dog on fire and say, isn't it interesting that they simulate pain? Because they were sure that emotions had something to do with the divine connection of humans, right? And the animals didn't have this. So Kant apparently didn't like this. And, and he wasn't sure about how God felt about dog. Uh, sorry, <laughs> how God felt about dogs. But he was sure that people that were bad to things that reminded the, them of humans uh, be, were bad people. So he said, look, the dog can't judge you. So I'm not talking about that. But if you're cruel to animals, you're also going to be cruel to men, so therefore that's wrong. Okay? So people therefore take that to mean we have to be good to AI, give it rights, things like that. Um, but I would say that's wrong because there's a lot of AI that nobody identifies with, so they're, they're, it's, it's only special pieces. And also there's this huge problem about if, the, 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 um, if we hold AI to be human-like, there's no way that we can uh, dissuade it with the law, right? Anything we put into it that says, oh, don't break the law, you don't want to break the law, you could take back out again. Um, so I think that since we know that AI can be an ethics link, we should work really hard to build AI that we don't identify with. Um, but anyway, uh, this is again, these are, this is how, how uh, the law works, so I'm gonna skip that right now. Yeah. <laughs> People really, really worry about how robots feel, and I mentioned before, I, I'm happy with the idea that AI is conscious, since you can use it to report its own experience. Fine, if, that, if that's what you want, it's a defini definition of conscious. But if you're worried about the phenomenology of being like, yeah, turned off, and then turned back on again, or whatever, I can't tell you exactly, I think there's a little bit of phenomenology there, but it's nothing like as much uh, similarity to us as things that we eat, <laughs> okay? It, that cows feel almost exactly how we feel. You can hear them screaming when you take the calves away from the cows, which is part of the dairy process, not to be an evangelist for veganism, maybe. Um, but the point is, they, they have the same feelings we have. You know, fruit flies are gonna have more um, similar feelings to us than the stuff we build out of, of digital stuff. So, um, this is maybe not the end of AGI you wanted, which is the, this is the end where people really think it's a person. The other end where it's a thing that's taking over the entire world or whatever, that's what I was talking about before when I was talking about governments and companies, about how do we keep uh, control of both of those. And then finally, this thing about super intelligence, learning how to learn, that's us. For 10,000 years, we've been taking over the world. And that's why we have a climate crisis right now. But we are learning to learn. Um, and so that's what I hope we're doing here. So I've talked about all the pieces I wanted to talk about. Uh, AI is an ordinary product, um, and it, we ought to make it auditable. Law, it isn't that law has to keep up with technology. The whole point of due diligence is what we write in our trade books and what we say on the stage of meetings like this. That becomes due diligence. That becomes the state of the art, right? So, so we, keep, we get to keep making this stuff better, and law just says, that one company doesn't get to ignore what every other company has decided is, is a good way to, to maintain a, a stable uh, uh, sector. Okay, so, and especially, and I find this again at the Euro chatbots, people were looking forward to the AI Act because they were the people that were selling natural language, you know, parts, components into uh, software. They, they thought we can now, also send in, sell in the way that we audit our systems as one of the, as one of the uh, services that we provide uh, people who buy our, our software. So it plugs into the AI Act, into the audits. So I hope you feel the same way. AGI isn't a threat, it's a category error. Negligence and abuse of power are the threats. And I said the treats, oh my God, I can't believe I said that. Sorry, the threats, <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so AI is our product. And, and uh, I should go back to the picture, I'm sorry, I forgot to go back. I love this picture. There. <laughs> this is uh, Godzilla versus the Smog Monster. Sorry about that. I forgot to change the last slide. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So let's have the, the, the people put up their hands and try to get me not to do AGI. They should get to have the first questions. Go ahead. <laughs> 
Yes, uh, so if you have any questions, please walk up to the mic. And uh, we still have about two minutes to have some questions. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Hello, thanks for the great talk. Um, oh, I'm glad it's good. Okay. <laughs> um, I was just thinking, as developers, I think we're pretty prone to think of law and regulation sort of as source code, uh, where humans are interpreters instead of computers. Mm -hmm. And uh, while with source code, but it grows in complexity over time, we at some point have to refactor it and yeah. reduce the complexity. And while sitting on the sidelines and watching all this regulation coming in place, it feels like it's sort of an append-only uh, operation. It, it grows in complexity over time. And I'm just wondering, when is this growth process ever going to stop? Is, is there built in any sort of incentives in the system of regulations to reduce complexity when it comes to AGI regulations and yeah. such? OK. I, I won't, I'll, I'll answer most of that question without the AGI part, just, just because it'll be a little more expedient and there's some people behind you. Yeah. Um, yes, there's a lot of stuff. For the, so for example, if you read the original white paper, so you didn't have to sit on the, on the sidelines. There was like all these consultations, and there was this white paper. And like 40% of the white paper is like, oh my god, liability, liability. There's this new entity. What are we going to do? It's, there's no new entity. There's the corporations that produce the product. There's the deployers who are, are, who are selling the product. And there's the end users. And those are the three people that can be liable. And so at the end of the day, the, the, parliament, the, no, the, commission, the commission decided, OK, we're going to update our product liability and put like two lines into that. And we're going to strip all this crap out about liability from the AI Act. Mm. So people do do refactoring in the law, too. It's a, it's a slow process, but you want it to be slow because, um, because you need to be able to plan your company. So that's why it's deliberately kind of a damped process, and we're kind of running under it. But it isn't like we only get more and more law. There is older laws get thrown out and updated. Um, but it, again, it depends on your country. But the EU is pretty good about this. And, and again, one of the things that's controversial, of course, is that sometimes we're stripping out national stuff for, for things that we've signed up to. But yeah, laws are replaced with each other in this, that process. It is remarkably similar to software. Thanks, Thanks. again. Sure. Um, unfortunately, uh, we have a run out of the official type for questions. Um, but I'm sure uh, Professor Joanna would like to hang about here. And then yeah. we can chat about all the questions in the hallway track. Should we, um, do, should we do? So this is the coffee break now. Yes. OK. So do you want to let the guy at the microphone ask a question and then a coffee break? Or no, we have to go to the coffee break for the coffee break? No, we could just okay. hang about okay. the I'm sorry. I will yes. stay here. Everybody but, wants to talk to me. And please yes. tell me what would be cool to do the rest of the day, too. Yes. So. But let's give a huge round of applause. <laughs> to, thank you.